So over the last year or so, I've done several episodes on men's issues within the church. This is a topic that is rarely ever covered, and it's a tragedy. These things need to be discussed. It was surprising, and, and yet not so surprising, that we had such a big reaction on each one of these episodes from both men and women. There, there were questions brought up like, where are all the men in the church? Uh, where's all the masculinity? Where is the leadership uh, on, on one end? And on the other end is, you know, is elders quorum even working? What about nice guy syndrome? Is niceness even a virtue? I brought on Kurt Frankum from Leading Saints podcast for this interview and this topic because he's got a lot of feedback from bishops and stake presidents and others that are working through these types of issues. We discuss such things as the three core desires of a man's heart. Are these things being addressed at church? Uh, grown men don't really have friends. Why is that? What do we do? And also what Kurt calls the little league trap. This is an area that we seem to ignore. And yet you can see from the responses that this is tapping into a nerve here. This is tapping into something that both men and women want to discuss, need to discuss. And there are really solutions that are needed to try and take care of some of these problems. I think you'll enjoy this. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we have got a good friend of mine, Kurt Frankham from Leading Saints. Kurt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back, Greg. Yeah, we, mean, are, we are going <laughs> to discuss great. something here that I think really taps a nerve with, with oh, people. We've done a couple of episodes on this on the show, talking about men in the church, men's issues in the church. We get hundreds and hundreds of comments on these topics. And with your vast knowledge and, and experience and background in leading within the church, I think that this is something that comes across your desk quite often. And I want to tap into that knowledge a little bit. And yeah. uh, and see what you've got to say. Starting off, a very simple question: Is elders quorum working? <laughs> you know, uh, man, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, if you if you were to poll the the general population of of Latter Day Saints and even elders in the, in the church, I think most of them would say, ah, you know, not really. I, and and again, it's not that the problem is nobody knows what to do about it, right? It's like, well. You know, it's the second hour. Now we do it every other week, and the women are in their, are in their relief society. And let's get the men together, and maybe we can figure something out. But you know, I think there's just you, you look around in an elders quorum, and there's a lot of scrolling going on. And I don't think that means that they're in the the middle of the conference uh, talk per se. And you know, and I, I'm speaking generally. Maybe there, and, and I have interviewed uh, through on leading saints, remarkable elders quorum presidents who are doing some really uh, out-of-the-box approaches to Elders Quorum to make it uh, more of a, a a benefit to the men who show up on Sunday. But, but you know, it is sort of the forgotten uh, organization in the church. And the the irony of it all, the sad, sad irony of it all, is that if you were in, on, in a typical Sunday, if you were to consider all the meetings and groups happening in award building, like Relief Society, the youth, um, Sunday school or whatever, Elders Quorum is at the most risk of a suicide than any other uh, organization in the church. And that surprised a lot of people. A lot of people think, no, it's the youth. You know, look at all the mental health concerns happening with the youth. And and even you look at the budgets and the attention and it skews towards the youth and and rightly so. I mean, it's it's tough being a teenager in 2023. And but my my uh, contention is that if you want to fix the youth, you have to walk down the hall and fix elders quorum. If if the youth do not have men who know how to step into their masculinity in the church, it, that all the youth conferences and missions and things just it just won't work at, at the end. So you know, there's the you know, there's this. I, I, we might have I might have even brought this up last time. I don't know, but it's you know, there, there's the the thought again. You're on a you're on an airplane, and and the the masks fall, and you're supposed to put the air ma the the oxygen right. mask on, and you take care of yourself first because you got to make sure that you can take care of everybody else. Mm -hmm. right? So if you're yeah. a parent, you've got a child with you, you better make sure that you've got that oxygen mask on, or you're not going to be able to help anyone. Yeah, yeah, right. It seems like it's the same kind of idea. 
Yeah. You're no good if you're passed out in the seat and and others around you need help. (laughs) And the the heart of men are is suffering. I mean, it's a lot of men are not alive. They're, you know, maybe to use an um something that's an overstatement, they're they're dead inside at times. They don't, they're just sort of going through the motions, you know, and it's it's sad. So what what do we do? How do you change that? (laughs) What do we do? This is not just something, an observation you're having, right? Right. This is, like I said, I mean, there is a lot of discussion on this. When when someone actually broaches this subject, which we rarely do, right? There's Mm -hmm. a huge response on it, both from from both men and women on this. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, with the best intentions, the church, you know, as an organization is trying to is trying to some extent, you know, trying to offer them something. Obviously the church offers men, um, you know, saving ordinances, like, great. We got that. We got the temples. We have the ordinances, the keys, the the authority, but um, there's not much else other than maybe guilt trips or service assignments that, you know, that uh, fall flat or ministering assignments, but, you know, men maybe don't know how to connect or even reach out to individuals. And so what we do is we have to begin to, by becoming students of how what what is at the core of a man's heart, and there's various uh, authors and organizations and other I mean in across the board of Christian organizations they're all wrestling with this question of what do we do with men, and society doesn't have an answer because they're saying well maybe just be more feminine right like less masculinity maybe that's the problem is you know toxic masculinity toxic max- masculinity and all those things or or hey here's some porn you know just go go uh you know do your thing with a numb out to porn and maybe you can survive the next week right i mean there's just these empty solutions and even the church you know we we make the mistake of offering sometimes what i call models of mr rogers and now don't get me wrong i i was raised on mr rogers and i love mr rogers and there's so much benefit there and fred rogers himself was an incredibly masculine indiv- individual when it came to standing in front of congress and and pleading for his uh, his organization but uh we we mr rogers often this caricature of what a quote unquote man should be right very submissive meek and, and meek i mean that's a whole nother discussion that elder bednar's broken wide open which i love yeah but just like the emasculated like just be really nice right mm-hmm. and and again that we're just having this conversation i'm not here to uh you know offend anybody but you look at the models of masculinity that christian organizations including ourselves put forward it is often this mr rogers figure right and was jesus like that like was 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 there any passion? I mean, a, a Jesus who literally made a whip, who literally turned tables over. Like there was a a warrior type of masculinity in him that he was. I mean, to stand in front of the Pharisees, and you know, and I, we see this in you know in the chosen of of standing in the face of tradition and saying that, that we're not doing this anymore. Like that that is not a submissive individual who's just there not to to make waves he obviously made waves right and um so again uh, going back to your question i'm sort of just laying out here what the what we what we attempt to do in trying to fix the problem is um is uh, another thing is hyper focusing on the spiritual behaviors right and that's sort of what elders quorum could be like sort of this this undertone of like you're not doing enough like you could do more like keep you know and and the the shame and and whatnot um, and, um, so what, what do we do about it is we try and understand the, the heart of men. And there's a phenomenal author, a uh, Christian author named John Eldridge. I've interviewed him twice on the leading saints podcast, and he is so expert at communicating and articulating what the core desires of a man's heart. Now he puts forth a framework. Uh, I'm not saying it's the end all framework, but man, it's, it's definitely a good starting point. He, he talks about the, the core desires of a man's heart. Um, is a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to love. And without those core, without recognizing those core desires and speaking to those core Can you desires, say those three again: battle to so, fight, a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to love. And if we don't recognize that those are in the room when we're in elders' quorum, it's just going to fall flat every single time. Uh, the the Mister Rogers model doesn't always fit into that. And so um, 
And he, he talks about this concept that every man is born with one question that they spend their whole life answering. And that is, do I have what it takes? And all of us can think back, especially at a time in our boyhood, most likely with our father or a father figure in our life, where we receive the message with the help of the adversary of, you just don't have what it takes and you're going to fail. Right. And we don't know how to, how to handle that because yeah, are, masculinity. Are you a man? Yeah. Are you a man? Are you a man? Yeah. Yeah. When trouble arises, when strength is is needed in a situation, do you have what it takes to be that strength? And this is the question that every man is is chasing for their entire life. And if we take that question to any other place but God, we we will uh, we will uh, suffer. It, it it will corrupt our souls. And oftentimes, men take that question to porn. Men take that question to careers. Men take that questions to their wife, which is so dangerous. Of like, can you can you answer this? Like, do I have what it takes? The only place you can take that question mm. is to God, because masculinity bestows masculinity. Our masculinity comes from an eternal God, and only He can answer that question of Do you have what it takes? And the answer is yes. Of course, you have what it takes. I so created. Shouldn't you. this be addressed though more than? I mean, you're saying that you're, you're saying if these things, yeah. those three things aren't there. I mean, yeah. I, I would say to the third one, at times that's there, right? We, mm-hmm. we talk yeah. about marriage and and being a good husband, and you know, in well, certain ways, perhaps we could do a better job of that. But those, well, first but the, two, the message, the message of being a good husband, maybe we can get into this later, is often comes about of you know the date night, right? And the joke, and I hate this joke. Like, get rid of it if you're ever tempted of like. Oh, you know, I just do what the lady says, and that's how yeah. a happily marriage. Like that is so weak, and and displays your such weak masculinity. Like we're mm-hmm. not here to just just do what what the the lady in our life wants, right? We're there to offer her strength, right? And um, so often the message comes like this: focus on marriage is like, well, do the date night, right? Just like don't don't ruffle her feathers, right? When in reality, you see sometimes these uh, remarkable women that end up with jerks because at least that jerk knew, even though it maybe wasn't in appropriate ways, he revealed masculinity in a way that made mm-hmm. him attractive. Right. Anyways, I, we can go into that later. No, but. that that's, that, that, that's a good point. So it's, but, but again, then, so it's, it's a matter of broaching that subject mm-hmm. in places like elders quorum, right. Of what you're saying is actually developing the characteristics then of offering that strength instead of just what do I do for her? Right. Right. It's, right. it's who do I become? Yeah. Because that's really the adventure, right? I mean, that's that's part of that adventure as well. It's like, how who am I becoming mm-hmm. and how am I enriching, uh, uh, gaining a greater enrichment in life through my masculinity, through being a man and through developing those characteristics? Right. Where, whereas oftentimes, like you said, it, it's focused on the date night or what aren't mm-hmm. you doing or... Yeah et cetera, instead of, look, who are you becoming? How are you developing these characteristics? Right. Yeah. Because, you know, if we we default to just, oh, just take her on a date night, make sure you, you know, um, you kiss her at night and you, you you do the dishes and whatnot. And, you know, and that's what the trap men fall into when it comes to sexuality, right? Like no amount of doing the dishes will end up, you know, a man, a woman does not want a man who who just does the chores around the house. And then, uh, you know, she rewards him with, you know, sex. And mm-hmm. that is a flawed thinking. A woman wants a, a man that offers strength to the, to, to her and to the family and, and, uh, you know, takes, takes the lead in some of these things. Um, and that's, that's masculinity. That's, that's what's, attractive. are we, are we, are we as a church, as men in the church, are we lacking leadership in our families? I mean, cause you got these two sides, right? You've got, you've got society that is moving us further and further into really a more feminized world. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's this toxic masculinity and, oh, I better, I better, you know, I'm a rough stone rolling. I better smooth out these rough edges a little right. bit more. And, and uh, and become a little bit more feminine with some of these things, and not let my masculinity um, present itself so much. And and then on the other side, it's like, well, there are a lot of women. You know, a lot of the responses that I've had on these videos uh, is a lot of the women saying, "Where are the men? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute here. Where are these guys? Because I don't see them. Right. And I'm having, yeah. or I'm having a hard time finding them. Or and I hope my boys grow up." with these attributes because I'm very concerned about the way things are going right now in the church. Yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, oftentimes uh, the the front we put forward is we want uh, we think what women want is a well behaved man. When in reality, they want a man who's alive, whose heart is alive, who's ready to to take on the world and have purpose. Right, um, and oftentimes. Um, John Eldridge talks about this concept of a larger story, that all men need a larger story to recognize that they're in a larger story, when in reality, we shrink to a smaller story. We think, Hmm. okay, you know, I just got to go to college, get the job. My dad was a dentist, so I'll be a dentist. My dad is an attorney. I'll be an attorney. I'll just sort of follow that model because I don't know what else to do, even though there's sort of this, this greater call uh, beckoning them that that's coming from God to step into that that feels a little risky, but it isn't that risk where uh, that where men come alive. And you see this. I, I experienced in my own life where I had the job, but I was I was I felt this call to step into a higher calling, a larger story of producing content that's going to help uh, leaders across the world. And it was scary, and it was you know two or three jobs at times and making it meet. But I I was so alive in this effort. Uh, even though there was a little bit of risk, like I didn't know how it would turn out and I still don't know how to turn out, but uh, there's a little more stability now in my my career and whatnot. And so a lot of men sort of uh, push this, this larger story, this call to a larger story aside. And that's exactly what women want is a man who's stepping into a larger story that that God is inviting them into. And, and unfortunately we miss it. So that story going back to point number two, there is, is, is an adventure. Was it an adventure to live? An adventure to live. An adventure to live. How do you bring an adventure into Elders Quorum? No, this is you- great. So, so the reality, like uh, I had uh, in my last ward, um, they announced in Elders Quorum that they were going to go do this shooting, uh, go shooting. You know, they were going to have a Saturday morning, go to the church, going to have a little breakfast, and then go shooting. And the Elders Quorum president called me, and he knew I had experience, you know, doing retreats and and focus for men and focusing on this topic of, of men in the church. And so he's like, okay, I just want to do this right. What, what am I doing? I'm like, listen, you're doing it. The fact that you're creating an activity for men to go shooting. I'm not, I'm not much of a gun guy or a shooting guy. I don't hunt or anything, but you see some men at that activity. There's nothing, but nothing to describe other than their heart is alive when they're aiming at that, that clay pigeon and they see it explode. Right. And so the, but the point that, that sometimes the, the overtone of, of the message we get in the church is like, Hey, 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 like time to grow up now. There's no reason to like leave your family. You need to be at home with on Saturday and help around the house or right. Like men need an adventure to live. They need, whether it's the weekend warrior or I'm going to, you know, go to, go to Spain. I'm going to go back to my mission. I'm going to, you know, whatever it is, they need these, um, this time of adventure where they feel like, well, like when's the last time uh, an adult man in in the life of those that are listening turned to someone and said, I can't believe we're doing this. This is so great. Like that we think, oh, those were the teenage years. No men that mm-hmm. need that adventure. Right. And, and, and in my life, like it's maybe not hunting or, or fishing or these things, but I love to travel. I love to experience the world. I love to just leave it all behind and take my kids and, and go experience a phenomenal place. Like that is adventure and men need these things. And so in the context of an elders quorum, um, you know, there's always talk. It just makes me chuckle about sometimes, you know, at least in years past, there's a discrepancy between how much money the young men got in the ward as opposed to the young women for activities mm-hmm. and things. And I said, has anybody looked up the Relief Society budget as of late and the Elders Quorum budget? Like there is a huge discrepancy. And and so the first like the best thing an Elders Quorum president could do is, is to march into the bishop's office and fight for a budget. And say, no, we're going to do some things. We're going to go on an outing. We're going to, you know, whatever it is, like you, an elders quorum can stimulate adventure, whether it's a shooting activity, whether, I mean, on and on a fishing trip, or even just whether it's, you know, elders quorum sanctioned, like an elders quorum president. Uh, presidency could stimulate, like who who are the diehard fishermen in, in the, in the quorum? Hey, why don't you guys get together? You guys need to go on a, on a fishing trip because one crucial in this adventure, sort of a subtopic in the adventure concept is that like there is a, there is a place in a man's heart that can only be filled by other men. Masculinity bestows masculinity, but we often we're, we're pushing the date nights, right? Which is important. But if we don't also push that men need men. Men need to go out and adventure with men. And there's, I mean, you think back of any time you've sat around a fire with other men and just talked 
or you've gone to a movie together and talked about these epic stories we see on the screen, like that nurtures a man's heart and creates brotherhood. And so there, there's another principle of, of what, what the church can offer is brotherhood. We sort of attempt to do it, but, but we fall flat. Of, but we need to do better at connecting people, whether it's through adventure or battle or or um, um, just it, through spiritual um, experiences, we need to stimulate brotherhood and mentorship in these contexts. It seems like we're almost going the opposite way, though. It seems. Oh, we are. It seems like we are, like you said, I think more and more men, and this is in society more broadly, but in the church as well, are more and more isolated. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it, there's a feeling of isolation uh, among men, I think more, and it's always been there a little bit, right? I mean, let's mm-hmm. be honest, men have not been as good at connecting with others as women have been. And, and so there's there, but, but, you know, whether, whether it's video games, whether it's porn, whether mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, anything else where there's this isolation and this lack of social camaraderie, like you said, brotherhood, it seems like we move more and more toward that. And men are now leading, as we say, these quiet, desperate lives. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Isolation is sort of the man, like that is where the adversary wants us to go, especially men. And we will, we'll jump in because it's just easier to go there. It's easier to, to shrink and, and keep to ourselves and, you know, keep tabs on the family, I guess. I just gotta, you know, I just gotta fight through it. And, and no wonder that the, that it is, these, you know, the elders quorum, which is most at risk of a suicide is it's mm-hmm. that isolation that takes over because uh, the world, the church, and even themselves, they don't have that. Na- they're not offering an answer to feed their masculine heart. Let me go back to the first one. You said a, a battle to fight. Um, so this one is, 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 I think, and I've talked about this quite a bit on, on the show is, you know, men rally around a banner. Right. They, they rally around a cause and, and we're good at it. We're good at doing that. Mm-hmm. And, and, but there has to be that inspiration in order mm-hmm. to do it. Right. There has to be someone and something that's like, okay, the cause or the person or whatever that I can rally around. I mean, we'll do that. And, and we do a pretty good job. I don't see that happening very much anymore. Right. Where, where it's kind of like, what do you stand for? What, what are you, what are you, what is your battle? And I'm not talking just about a culture war or or anything like that, but just right. just you know what what are are you relishing in what you stand for, mm-hmm. and how is that supported, and and how is that developed? I don't know that the message is oftentimes there uh, in in our in our wards and our quorums of of having that banner up of what are we rallying around, right? Yeah. And, and a good example of this sort of, uh, um, well, an example of this is you look at, uh, for example, Kobe Bryant's career or Michael Jordan's career, like to use a sporting parallel, like they obsessed over the battle of mm-hmm. like, of getting that championship trophy. Right. And the reality is, is all men need a trophy to battle for, to hoist at the end of an accomplishment, to celebrate, right? And in the sports context, it's obvious, and it's and but obviously none of us have the the skill level of of to, to play in these these Let's leagues or whatnot. For yourself, it, come on, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, but and sometimes they'll manifest it through a company a softball league, right? Mm-hmm. And and those things are great, right? And and it doesn't have to be like like purpose is important, and that's where I almost default to the larger story concept, like what larger story are we offering in others' quorum, but. Also, like we should never shame men for for getting excited about the the company softball league or the, the whatever league they're playing in, mm-hmm. and sometimes they they really put themselves out there even when their body is past their prime, and they may you know have horrible injuries and whatnot. But th- that's the that's the masculine heart saying you need a battle, right? And that mm-hmm. could be in in the context of um of uh, you know sales goals if you're in a sales job or in your career or whatnot for me and, and this is one thing the church does offer is when i was called as a bishop uh that was that was a remarkable journey of having a battle like to show up there you know on sundays and to like gather you know rally the troops and get my bishopric together and we're going to put plans together we're going to do this and that let's see how it goes all right that didn't work like all right back to the drawing board like that fed my soul but unfortunately, there's just not enough of those leadership opportunities to go around to do it all, right? Mm-hmm. 
Um, but we could offer them more of of purpose of, of having an elders quorum where you sit with this concept of, of a larger story. Uh, you know, I had one individual come to one of our men's retreats and he was a, uh, a physical therapist. And after he had mulled over this concept of a larger story, he came to me at the end and said, man, you know, I've always been passionate about working with kids in, in physical therapy. I'm going to transform my entire practice I'm going to focus on kids. Like that's where I feel like the call is coming and that's going to be tricky because I'm going to have to restructure this or that or change my marketing. Right. But it was suddenly he came alive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's not like this cookie cutter, larger story or purpose thing, but we, in our elders corners, we need to stimulate that. We need to, we need to talk about it and come together and say, where, where did you slip into your smaller story this week? And how can you stay in your larger story? Yeah, well, it was like that purpose and that cause, mm-hmm. you know, it's the same type of thing. And I don't know that it's always even necessary for you to be in the leadership position. If I'm in a bishopric and I've got someone like you as bishop that's all excited and ready to roll and mm-hmm. wanting to change things, I want to participate. Like I said, I yeah. want to rally around that. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of men do. They want to rally around those types of things. And so it's great to have those leadership uh, opportunities. But again, if there's just a banner, I think sometimes then it's. It's something that uh, that we can rally around. Now, on yeah. the on the softball, you know, another another point on that is, you know, one thing. You know, when I was young, uh, growing up in the church, when I was a teenager, uh, and then even as a young uh, a young early uh, married man in my twenties, you know, we had the basketball going all the time. We we yeah. had the you know we had we, they didn't go all the way to Salt Lake like they used to do, but yeah. they had the regional <laughs> tournaments. Mm-hmm. That was that was such a big deal to me and, and to my friends. Yeah, and I had it, a couple of friends where you were allowed to have one non-member on the team on oh, the court really? <laughs> at a time. And I had a guy that came all the time. He loved being a part of that, and it was a great exposure for him. And it was not like some great conversion story or anything, but but it was he there, he felt the brotherhood there at, uh, among among us young guys, and and he loved being there. And we were good. We were a good team, and we yeah. went all the way to the to the regionals and and. You know, that was really important. And then in softball, I remember, you know, you had the elders and sometimes the young guys would get together and 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 play and they'd have their tournaments and and God, just guys really got into that and had a lot of fun. And I feel like what what held that back is like there would be fights sometimes or there was yeah. a little too much intensity, which is going to happen. Right. And 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 that I don't know the church headquarters or whoever either decided you know what we just don't want to mess with this. There's too much contention. There's too much conflict. And I just feel like, you know, can't we just manage that a little bit and let this? Because those programs are not nearly as prevalent mm-hmm. anymore in the church. Oh yeah, and, and, and there there are other reasons, social reasons for that because there's so much else going on. Battle for time is hard, you know, but it's. I don't know, it's kind of a tragedy to me that those it things is. aren't uh, as prevalent as they used to be. Yeah, because consider what that did for that priest quorum, right? I remember my priest quorum, like we on Saturdays, we got to rally together and battle for something together. And mm-hmm. we were different. We had a different relationship on Sunday because of that. And, uh, you know, and generally speaking, like the church, our church is really good of like creating structure and opportunities for uh, some of these positive experiences, you know, through those youth years. Now we have FSY, you know, remarkable organization. We yes. have, we have weekday activities, right? I'm currently serving as a deacon's quorum advisor. And, and like, these are, these are crucial for those developmental years. And then, you know, after we graduate from the, the youth programs, we go on missions and, you know, missions have their own problems, whatever we talk about another time, but but nonetheless, it's a structure of like, we're sending you across the world and you're going to this, this country to learn the language. And I mean, you hear these stories. We both have these mission stories that are like epic stories, right? We almost feel like we're in a movie, right? But when we come home and then it's like, hey, just get married, man. Yeah. And here we go. You just make sure you dial in that date night. You go you go get a job, go to college. Okay, just like, all right, don't, don't mess this up, all right? Then get those kids to school call your get those kids to church you know do that fhe and all right like come follow me no don't forget if you're gonna follow me right like it suddenly just is instantly gone the the structure of mm-hmm. like of, of feeding the soul of a man of of of, of these remarkable experiences that are transformational and then it just falls yeah. off well wait a minute well you're you're describing something though that is coming up to the time of marriage mm-hmm. or at least in your 20s early 20s mm-hmm. and then it's gone 
is gone. It's so gone. the structure becomes the family. Yeah. Or if you're not married, you're completely isolated then, or not completely, but you're isolated from yeah. this. What, what, what are, what do we do then? What, yeah, what yeah. goes beyond the mission? What goes beyond the, the period? The, I saw a meme the other day on, uh, online that like the one, one of Jesus's greatest miracles is that he had 12 friends as an adult man. And someone said, well, actually he only had 11, but anyways, um, but like men generally, yeah, we, that, that we take, we sort of embrace the family as the new structure. And, and mm -hmm. I'm right there with you with, I have deep conviction and a testimony of the doctrine of the family and, uh, and all those things that come with it, but it's net. I don't, I don't believe it was ever meant to be our structure of mm -hmm. feeding our heart as men. And it mm -hmm. plays a role, but it's more of the the end game of like, what are you bringing to that structure? Are you bringing strength or are you just trying to stay out of the way and not do anything stupid, right? And 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 so that's why, and, and this may seem like exaggerated, but I would guess in an average elders quorum, 50% of men have looked at porn in the last month. And I don't mean like, oops, I clicked there. And, ah, oh no, back. Mm -hmm. Like sat down or pulled up their phone and saying, I am looking at porn. I would easily say 50%. And wow. well, hey, the family structure's there. Like, what's the problem? Right. Like I'm I'm going to church, I'm doing my things, but their heart is dead inside because they don't have a battle anymore. They uh, they don't have any adventure because they're just supposed to stay, you know, with the family and, and the, you know, what I call the little league trap is, I'm going to the little league games. Like those are all the stories. Like, well, at least my dad came to my little league games. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you, you did nothing with your life. You had no larger story. And I am, I, I truly believe in it. Every day I fight for this larger story that I'm trying to live in. And yeah, sometimes even this week, I am traveling up to the uh, Boise area to speak at a conference and and to do a youth fireside there. And and guess what? My kids are going to have to stay home. They won't have a father in the home. But when I return. I will be able to offer them strength and mm. th to have my kids come to, to some of the events I do to see me speak on a stage, to invite them up on the stage with me. I have no doubt when my kids grow older, they will say, you know what? Dad wasn't there every once in a while. And maybe he didn't make every little league game, but wow, he did something special with his life. Like he was, he was involved in a purpose that I don't quite understand or can't wrap my head, my head around, but he would did something special in life. Like, that is how that's the example we want our kids. Not that, well, my dad was always at dinner and in our little league games, but I don't know what why he was what he was really doing or why he had that job or what like we got to model to our family that yeah, that structure is important, but what are you offering that structure? Yeah, are you animated in those scenarios? Yeah. I mean, you're at dinner, but are you are, are you leading? Are you are yeah. you generating that story? Like, you are, said? You are you alive? You know, alive? like it's just, or are you just dreading the next day? You know, to get through. Are you dreading yeah. bedtime? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. Nice guy syndrome. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is really a pet peeve of mine. Honestly, it's it's you know I, I talk about the the uh, uh, the spiral of silence a little bit with, oh, with the church. I and, love that. And, and kind of like, we don't want to, this is something in other cultural issues I talk about, but, uh, just kind of like, there's not a whole lot of, I'm going to speak up. It's, it's again, it's kind of a, let's not be a rough stone rolling. Let's, let's, let's smooth out the, uh, the roughness on everybody and, and wear the white shirt and button up. And, and, and we get this idea of, well, niceness is a virtue. In fact, in fact, niceness is Christianity. Mm -hmm. Niceness is being a Latter-day Saint man. Yeah. And 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 this, you know, th this idea again of going back to Jesus. And as I talk about a teddy bear Jesus, you know, it's like this model, like somehow we're supposed to have this teddy bear Jesus model and that these men are going to have that somehow is going to inspire them. And 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 we're building this replication. Uh, uh, and and almost meme, as you said, about about what an LDS man is, right? Right. Of of he's nice. It's a, he's a nice man, mm -hmm. and niceness is not a virtue. Mm -hmm. It's not a virtue. Yeah. So so why is that happening? Oh, why, man. why do we have this idea of you're not controversial? You, there's never conflict with you. You're not stepping uh, out into adventure. You are simply in your lane and and nice, and there's no conflict with you. Yeah. So why does it happen? I mean, again, this falls into that that uh, Mr. Rogers model, right? And and I see it. It's so hard in a church context. You know, I'm the 
you know, uh, leading saints, we talk about all church leadership. And sometimes I've, I've had leaders in the past where they're really good at putting on that grin with their, you know, their press shirt and their, their suit and walk around the room and shake hands and smile and almost like overwhelm you with niceness. And you're just like, who are you? Like, this is not a human that's in front of me. I want to know who you are and where this comes from, um, is, is it, it, I mean, this is, it, it goes back to the the doctrine of divine identity, that, that we are children of God. And at some point, when, when we were born, we came out of the womb crying and, and knew, knowing that we, our cry would be heard and that we, we were deserving, that our needs mattered. And at some point along the way, we put ourselves out there in those developmental years and we got the message that no. We don't want you. You need to be something you're not. And I love the the parallels of the the uh, uh, what's the the returning son? What's the uh, the prodigal? The prodigal son. Thank you. Of the 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 term. There was this moment where he came to himself, where he recognized his identity of who he was, and that that was lovable. That he could return to a father, and then the the model of that father who just embraced him for who he was. But at some point we have to put off who we are and we have to put up a pose because the pose works. We all pose. And um, the pose, we learn at a young age that if we pretend we're better, then we'll be accepted more. And it's that, that inner desire of acceptance. And uh, I remember that as a, as a developing uh, teenager, I was the youngest of four, you know, my dad was in the state presidency. I was, I was like doing all the things. I wore the white shirt. I, 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 uh, you know, was the super seminary kid. Like, and I got these messages. I heard people talking to my parents of praising their son. Wow. Like your kids are just so good. Like you're, they're doing so great. And so the message with, well, uh, obviously there were great intentions that the message I was received was that, okay, if I want to be accepted, if I want to be praised, I've got to be super super Mormon. I got to, I got to check all the boxes. I got to do all the things. And if I make a mistake, oh boy. And there was that moment. I remember when I had to go to my Bishop, I had to confess some things and man, did I try to do that in such secrecy? And I, and I just pray that the building would fall on top of me. And man, what a contorted perspective of repentance I had, you know, like, of course you need repentance, Kurt. Like we all need repentance, but there's this feeling of like, oh no, my pose is being exposed. And so if I don't leave that up, I'm, I'm going to be exposed and they don't know who I really am. And so this progresses into a context of like elders quorum. If I don't raise my hand and sort of allude to the fact that, oh, we were with my family today doing come follow me. And my little nine-year-old had this great point of, man, he's just such a gospel scholar. At nine years, like we sort of put these poses <laughs> In front, because then if I can prove to elders quorum that I'm acceptable, then they'll accept me. Mm. But the core of the gospel is that Jesus loves you and accepts you right where we are. And that's when we're able to change and improve mm. and become better is when we stop faking it. And it's just, it's a tragedy that that continues to persist, unfortunately. Well, and it's, it's you're going right, you're stepping right into the, the idea again of, of, I mean, niceness is not a it's it's not a virtue because so often it is just fake. It's just fake, absolutely. Like because if I'm nice, great. I if I'm nice to you, I can sort of control how you feel, and if I control how you feel, I can control how I feel. It's mm. it's codependency, as as mm. the the therapists call it, right? Yes. Like I'm going to control how everything's going, and and leaders fall into this trap a lot. If if somebody stands up in sacrament meeting and maybe overshares, suddenly there's this tension, there's this awkwardness of the bishop feels like, oh boy, I've got to do something mm. to fix this. When in reality, it's like, no, nah, we can just sit here in this messiness. Yeah, maybe what that person said was inappropriate, but do I have to stand and fix it all? Like it's this desire to fix things so that I can feel good as long as I can make everybody else around me feel good. And that well, is just it's a trap. kind of nice to sit in that just for a little bit because it kind of breaks it pop it pops the bubble a little bit right it bursts the yeah. bubble the niceness bubble a little bit yeah and and, and, and to be able a little to like, reality can come in <laughs> yeah and we have to be okay with like approaching somebody and just saying them no or try this the next time you can't uh, maybe there's a church activity or or some type of activity and you can't go just say no I can't be there 
Do you yeah. have to say, well, you see my son, he's got this project and I just want to be a really good father. And I got to be there for my son. Like just say, can't be there. You're going to have to find someone else. Sorry. Like you don't, you don't owe anybody an explanation of why you have to make a certain decision, but that's what we do in this, in this uh, nice guy syndrome is we, we try and make, you know, ease it and, and make sure every, there's no ruffles in, in our relationships or whatnot. And, uh, and there's a phenomenal book uh, by Dr. Glover. I've actually interviewed him on Leading Saints uh, called No More Mr. Nice Guy. And he attacks us right on that we, somewhere along the path, we thought that nice niceness was the goal when it's not. It's masculinity. Yeah. Niceness is not a goal. It's mm. it's not a virtue. It's not Kindness a virtue. is a virtue, but that's yeah. the thing very good. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go over some of the comics that have come up on, on my uh I love a couple it. of these uh, uh, men's issue episodes that I've done in the past uh, and just get your feedback on this. Um, here, here's one uh, woman. She says, I, and, and again, like half of the time, these are women that are responding, not men, you know, that are mm -hmm. saying, where are the men? Mm -hmm. Where What is happening here? Right. She, she says, I totally agree. Thank you for bringing this up as the mother of three young men who I hope will be strong husbands and fathers in the gospel. I have seen this trend being a, a move away from masculinity and what they are up against in society. It has concerned me for a long time. How can women be more involved in this? <laughs> a million dollar question. Um, I mean, the women could be more involved by rejecting the niceness, mm -hmm. like demanding a real man, right? Um, not not giving in to the uh, resentment of like, oh, you know, we, we, you know, the, you know, sexuality is always seems to be the gauge sometimes in a man's life and his marriage. And seems like a man can feel like, well, as long as we're, if we're having sex, I think things are going well. If mm -hmm. we're not, uh, something's wrong. And so that's when resentment comes in or woundedness and, you know, you know, you just don't love me. And if you'd love me more, right. Like, reject that paradigm and um, allow a man to go out with the boys, allow a man to go be a weekend warrior and go on that canoeing trip or hike that mountain. And in fact, you know, encourage it. Um, you know, it is, it is so crucial for, for those things to not be shamed or feel like, Oh, you're abandoning us. Cause, and that's one of the, that's one of the, the, uh, the wounds of, of, women out there is the, the fear of abandonment. You no know, men are, are worried that uh, they won't be able to have what it takes and women are afraid they'll be abandoned. And so. Yeah. I was going to say, I just, she, this, this the other woman goes right along that. She goes right along that and says it. She says, um, it upsets me when the priestess session of general conference was changed just to an extra session, which now is gone. Also, I don't mm -hmm. have a problem at all with men having a priestess session. They need that instruction. I always felt that too. I always felt oh. like my wife wanted me there. It's like, yeah. no, I want you there. I miss I want the you old days. That. That's a good of... thing for you. That's a good thing, right? She yeah. says, I'm tired of being coddled as a woman that I need the church or society to prove to me that I'm as important as a man. It's patronizing to me. Don't get me wrong. I love the gospel and have a very deep testimony of it, but I am seeing the shift and I don't like it. I want my man strong. I want him to keep that drive of wanting to protect me and my children. And here's the interesting part. She says, I'm capable of it. I can do that. Mm -hmm. But I know it's important for my children to have the right role model in, in their father. And, and, and I don't want that. I want him to take that role. Right. Yeah. What I hear when I hear that is she is not wanting a present man. She's wanting a strong man. That's yeah. hopefully present a lot, right? Yeah. It, it, you can be, uh, you, there's plenty of options for men who are generally present or in the room, but few know how to extend strength to their family. And that's a good desire there. That's a good example of, of women want men to offer strength to the family. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, I think women could be more involved with this. I think they want to be yeah. more involved with this. I, my experience with my friends in the church and their wives, right, is that most of those wives want their men to lead. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like it's, you know, some kind of a, a competition here of, of uh, you know, feminism or, or oppressor versus victim type thing. It's like, no, I want him to lead. Yeah. And 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 maybe he's not doing that, but maybe right. he doesn't do that because he feels that society tells him don't do that. Right. That's not your role anymore. Right.
and, so and the best thing caught between. And, yeah, the best thing for a, a woman to do is re, to remind, and this is, goes across the board with anybody, whether it's an elder's court presidency or the the women in their lives, of remind them of their divine identity that you were created by a God that does re- remarkable things. So stop claiming, but you know, stop complaining about the job, quit the job, go do what you were always, what that call is, is calling you to do, right? For them to hear permission. And again, that's maybe a loaded term, but to them to feel like, oh, wait, like I can go do those things, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can go out with, you know, on that trip, the backpacking trip with, with the guys or whatnot, like, yeah, you need to go do that. Because then when you return, you can offer us strength and be the man who we want you to be. Yeah, appreciate that. All right, Kurt, wonderful discussion. Is there anything else you wanted to add in there? I know you've also got retreats that you do oh, yeah. for men that are that I've heard really good things about. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I've uh, just through Leading Saints, we've helped sponsor an organization called uh, Warrior Heart, and they put on uh, retreats for men. Uh, primarily, we've done them in Utah, in, in Wanship, Utah. Um, there's actually one happening this this weekend that we're recording, and then um, I'm going down to Arizona in Williams, Arizona, just outside of Flagstaff, April third, fourth, and fifth, and uh, we are uh, putting on a men's retreat down there, and uh, we have uh, plenty of room left. Uh, it's sort of our, it's our first time we've done this in Arizona, and there's a lot of interest there. But we we got a nice big venue to do that, and a few concepts that happen there um, that again this could be perpetuated in Elders Quorum is. Um, this concept of authenticity, uh, we, we, you know, that's sort of a buzzword right now in, in society, like, oh, we got to be authentic, right? But in, in an Elder Scorm context, um, authenticity, what that does is, is it communicates to the rest of the room that you're not, there's nothing wrong with you specifically because you struggle with things like pornography, like, uh, you know, employment or just, just life in general. And so to have an individual stand in front of them and tell their story, that's going to perpetuate authenticity. And another thing, men need that uh, uh, that uh, elders quorum could perpetuate is disconnection from from the world and connection to god and so in these retreats what we literally do and any elders quorum could do this is we take men up into the woods and we disconnect and we create a container where they can uh, engage with god and spend some time in reflection and and concept and we have an 80% return rate mm. at, with these retreats it is a transformational experience um, and we generally make them, we try and make them as affordable as possible. We have scholarships available. If someone thinks I, I can't even spare 50 bucks to go to something like that. Don't, don't let that stop you. We have uh, donors that have stepped up to, to put forth scholarships. And I have seen, uh, sitting, uh, stake presidents go through this one in particular came up to me after and said, wow, Kurt, I had no idea how far off I was. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're a stake president. Don't you have life together? Right? Like, uh, everything from state presence to those struggling with addiction to uh, men who just feel stuck in life. It is a remarkable time to just disconnect and uh, and turn to God. And we just create that container to do so. And uh, one thing that women could do is uh, is to encourage the men to go do something like that. And I promise you, we'll send home a man that can offer strength and uh, that is the type of man that you want to be married to. Awesome. Good stuff. Really appreciate the discussion. It's a topic that I think needs to be broached much, much more. Oh, and let me say, uh, Greg, sure, that if yep. people want more information, they can go yes. to awarriorheart.com for the details, and I can give you the link for the show notes and whatnot. All right, and we'll, we'll put it in the uh, yeah. in the description box. But the audience, if you guys have uh, something to say on this, make sure you put it into the comments, and we will respond. Thanks so much, Kurt. Appreciate the time. Thank you.